I don't think it was Nike. Reebok, Adidas, it was, was one, one of them. Converse, one of those. Somebody wanted to talk about a shoe deal, and Jimmy said, "Dre, you shouldn't be doing sneakers. You should be doing speakers." And so that's how the whole thing came together. Wow. So, yeah, let's just jump in because you're easy to have a conversation with, right, Peter? I guess. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today on Connection is Magic. Nice sign. Thank you. Straight out of Australia. <laughs> yeah, you started saying you were here a couple years ago with uh, Miley and Pharrell. So, peep, this, this is still a pretty active studio, I guess. Yeah, no yeah. question. Yeah. A lot of history to it. Before then, the uh, last time I was there, before then, was the Doors did with Skrillex. They did that. that the Doors and Skrillex yeah. did that here as well? Yeah, I did that oh. here. Yeah. Like, you're piling on the history. This is yeah. this is good. Okay. Because I was I was telling people, oh, it's cool. We're, we're recording in the room where they, they cut Angie by the Rolling, the Rolling Stones. Did Angie here? That's true. They've done a lot of stuff here. I, that's the only, you know, this is only more recent stuff I can think of. Yeah. Well, let's dive right in. This is a show about, you know, transitions and how life has a way of giving us these curveballs and we don't always want them. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, like, and then we get to learn and, and grow and that, and that fun stuff. It's fun on the other side, but it's not so much fun when you're going through it. So I got really inspired to, um, for my own transition, you know, to do a show about it. And then lo and behold, I'm interviewing all these, you know, amazing people and they're saying the same thing about their journey um for you you started out as a software engineer right something yeah right yeah music law software engineer that's that's a big leap it's uh, my training was in i mean my degree is in math and then i uh knew i was going to go to law school because basically math people were too smart for me so i had to go someplace <laughs> where i was smarter than the other people so I applied to law school, but I needed to make money. So I applied for a job for uh, working for Rockwell, you know, working on the space shuttle. Okay, wow. Because it paid better money than a summer job delivering flowers, which was my prior summer job. So I did that for four or five months. And then uh, I told them, oh, I just got into law school. Like, get into law school two weeks before you leave. They don't know any better. So I, I left and went to law school. That was it. Well, there's a little bit more there from what I know. Let's dig in further. I know uh, there's a woman named Sarah Tomato. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's her name. <laughs> Sarah Tomato. And there was a rejection letter I think she sent you, and, and you said, I reject your rejection letter. I had a nice little correspondence <laughs> with her. I rejected her rejection letter. Then I started asking her for information you know, about the dorms and where I could stay, and she wrote back and said, no, you don't understand. You were rejected. And I said, no, you don't understand. I didn't accept your rejection and let me know when I should be showing up and didn't go over big. Um, and then the sort of, <laughs> how old were you at this point, by the well, way? I was quite just, young? Yeah, I was 21. So, um, I could tell she was getting <laughs> fed up with me. So because I was 21 and, uh, you know, very, very mature, I took a <laughs> Hunt's ketchup bottle and there was a logo on it of a tomato and I took the tomato out and sent dear Ms. and put the picture of the tomato and sent it to her. That was the last I heard from her. That didn't win her over, Peter? No. Okay. I, no, I was, I was kind of done. I, I had to find a different school. At the time, you really wanted to attend Berkeley, right? Was there a period of, oh, shit, you know, what am I going to do now? Or was it like a quick, you know, transition to UCLA Law? Yeah, it was fine. I mean, I wanted to go to Berkeley because my best friend was there. He was in the physics department. Yeah. And so that's why I wanted to go there. But I didn't get in, so I went to UCLA, which is an incredibly great school. So Yeah, it's got a great reputation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, were you like, did you have to study really hard or did, did this just come naturally to you? Did I have to study hard for what? At, at UCLA Law. Like some people are just, you know, seemingly coast through things because they're just naturally, you know, good at things. Or some people have to like work harder, you know, to get to get good grades. Well, look, I, like I said, I went to Harvey Mudd College and the people there were incredibly smart. Yeah. And the math people there were sort of on a next level. Geniuses, right? Yeah, Geniuses, yeah really, yeah, really yeah. seriously mm -hmm. smart people. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was, uh, by the end of my, my four years there, I was, um, felt like uh, I'd been beaten down. So I went. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I went to law school and I walked in the first day, I looked around and saw all these people. And I went, God, these are all poli sci majors. I'm smarter than they are. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wasn't the best student. I was okay. But on the other hand, I had one of the best grade point to hours worked averages in the school. 
yeah, yeah, there you go. That was back when, like, I don't know if it still matters, but graduating towards the top of your class, I know, was important because my uncle went to University of Michigan Law School and he was he was uh, practicing until he was like eighty. Jeez, like, I like, hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but he said it was a, it was a big thing to graduate like at the top of your class back in the day. Yeah, it you was, know? and yeah, yeah, yeah. and I didn't. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, I did okay. I did okay. But um, yeah, no, it's still important. All the big law firms hire, you know, the top students. Still? Okay. Yeah, but I I actually didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't want to work at a big law firm. You know, it was sort of that 60s ethos, you know, where, you know, know, corporate. Yeah, fuck the man type of vibe, right? You know? Yeah. So I remember one of the few interviews I did Mm -hmm. was, uh, I think it was with Greenberg Glusker. I could be wrong about that. It was one of the big firms. Mm -hmm. And... The, the guy's interviewing me and he's asking me like, um, well, you know, uh, you know, your grades are okay, but what did you do in extracurricular activity that, you know, would further your career as a lawyer? Yeah. And, you know, I'd been on a bunch of boards that you see. I was on the pub board, the publications board. I was on the campus programs and activities office. You know, I did a bunch of stuff mostly because they paid and I needed the money. Um, <laughs> So the guy, but the guy said, "Well, what did you do that was could relate to your career as a lawyer?" I said, "Well, I ran the speakers program here." And he goes, "Well, no, I was thinking of more erudite things." And I said, "Well, I, you know, wrote some articles for the Alaskan Law Review, I think, something like that." And he goes, "He kept pressing me and pressing me, and he, I didn't know exactly where he's going." And he goes, "Well, no, I was thinking more of things like law review." I said, "Well, the law review people here are kind of the biggest jerks in the law school, so I have real no interest in working with them." And he goes, "Well." Excuse me, I was on the editor of the UCLA Review in 1966. I go, well, that's your problem, isn't it? <laughs> and <laughs> so they didn't have emails or faxes back then, but yeah. but by the time I got home, they messenger the rejection letter. So, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> you went to UCLA Law. Let's jump back there. Yeah. And then upon graduating UCLA Law, did you have a clear path ahead or was oh, there a no. period of, okay, what now? No, I had no path whatsoever. I, I, uh, I mean, I said, okay, I'll take the bar because that's kind of what you do. That's, that's what's next, right? Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. And so I took the bar. I still had no idea. As you can tell, I had not had a lot of success with the big law firms and so I had no job. So I decided, I read this book about, you know, practicing law on your own and I decided, oh, I'm going to open my own law firm. It's so, pretty ballsy back then, right? I mean, that's that's yeah, that, or, uh, yeah. or stupid. Uh, <laughs> right? So I did that for a while, and then I realized a lot of things I didn't want to do, which was run my own law firm. <laughs> you know, like whatever walked in the door, I handled dog bite cases, drunk yeah. driving. Which actually, if you're going to represent musicians, it's kind of good good uh, uh, practice because they they have all those problems. I heard you also say it's a little more interesting working with musicians. You know that are that are successful versus like the average everyday cases, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, well, it's interesting for two reasons. The people are interesting. And the other reason it's interesting is because when you're representing a, a musician or an artist, you're basically, you're the business person. You're running the business because mm-hmm. that's not what they do. They make music. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're working for uh, a big corporate firm and you're doing work for uh, an outside, you know, Microsoft or something, you're, yeah. you're basically... You're basically being told what to do. You know, you're not making a lot of the business decisions. The executives are. Well, on that note, I, you know, because I managed bands for a little while, you know that about me, yeah. right? And and in that time, the, I experienced something, and a lot of other managers and people in the business have, where there's always like that one guy in a band that like likes to handle the business stuff. Would you say that's true from your experience? Yeah, there's you know, and uh, sort of my experience is. Stupid artists don't make it. I mean, you know, like you can talk about how dumb an entertainer is. If there's not somebody smart in the group, mm. maybe sometimes it's the manager, but generally there's some business sort of oriented person in there or somebody who has a general good business sense. That's on a spectrum, I want to say, because I think of Jay-Z immediately and he's kind of at the most extreme end, I think, of like business acumen and and amazing artists. Well, you know? I mean, look but like, do- like yeah. Dr. Dre, you look at Metallica. Yeah, Dr. Dre, yeah, I mean... People you've worked with, right? People yeah. I've worked with, they're, yeah. they're smart yeah. people there, you know? There's, yeah. there's always somebody in the band, or if it's a solo artist, somebody that's, you, know, you just, if you're just dumb, you know, and you're just an empty vessel, you can have a 15 seconds of fame, but you're not going to hang around for a long time. I mean, how many artists get signed and how many artists make it, Peter? Very few. I mean, yeah. I've been fortunate that most of my artists and the clients have been career artists. They've lasted a long time. Let's go on the timeline. You were doing the dog bite cases. You were 
kind of bored, whatever was walking in the door, right? And then where does it go from, from there? Well, I mean, uh, my friend of mine from law school, Howard mm -hmm. King, who's now my current partner, was working at a firm called Manat in the music department, Manat Phelps. And he calls and says, if you know of anybody that wants a job in the music department or doing music law, there's going to be an opening on Friday. You go, well, why is that, Howard? He says, I'm quitting. I hate these people. And so I said, well, I'd like to do that. So uh, he quit and I applied. And after several months, they hired me. And that's how I started. And that's how you got your start as a music lawyer. Yeah. Somewhere along the line in the early stages of you as a music lawyer, um, Prince came into the fold, right? And he was a, a then unknown artist. I showed up at work and they dumped a bunch of files on me. And my, you know, my boss was Lee Phillips. He was a senior partner and he represented Prince. And Prince was, at the time, nobody. I said, who's this? Prince Rogers Nelson. I go, who the hell is this? So they said, you, you're going to be working on this. Actually, at the time, he was not that obscure because his first record made some noise, but he was more sort of the black community knew more about him than, you know, like us white folk. And so mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about him. And he was he was successful regionally, like in no, Minnesota. No, he was, that no, type no, thing, no. Or, he he got. National. And the story was, I wasn't there because it was before I started. Yeah. But um, he gave a demo tape to some of the uh, record companies, and and he had played every instrument himself and did all the arranging wow. and all the work himself. And so one of the A and R guys said, "I don't believe it." And they took him in the studio, and the guy just blew him away. And so he got signed to a very lucrative new artist deal. This again, before I was there, right off the bat. Still, he wasn't Prince, he was some artist that might make it or might not. So when you got the file, did you like get more familiar with his stuff and were you kind of blown away yourself when you started digging into what he was doing? You know, it was still early days for Prince, but you know, he was, I did it once saw a show, he played at uh, Flippers, was that the name of the roller rink on La Cienega and wow. Santa Monica? And he was amazing. And so I got to know his music and, you know, and work's the work or whatever the work is I did yeah. until he blew up and yeah. he came and said, son, you've done a good job on Prince. I think I'm going to take over now. And I, <laughs> son, I, wasn't, yeah, I, I wasn't talking to Prince so much after Purple Rain. Oh my God. Yeah. They say like success has many fathers. One of my mentors used to say. Yeah. Oh. Failure is an orphan. Failure is an orphan. Success has many fathers. Yeah. That's the line. Dr. Dre, Metallica. Pharrell, the list goes on, but like, you know, have you always had sort of a golden horseshoe, I feel like? Because like Prince is your first guy, and then like you get the call from your partner, Howard King. Like it seems like things just flowed for you. What was the next period of, oh shit, what now, you know? Well, when I got fired from Disney, that was... Oh, the... That's coming? Okay, yeah. we're not there yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but let's, let's make sure we stay with the timeline. You're a young lawyer at Manette. Phelps, Phelps, Phelps yeah, right? Yeah. And then after a period of time, do you and Howard leave and, and start your own thing? No, no. What happened was uh, Howard, um, he left pretty quickly afterwards and, you know, started, he went off and did his own firm. Okay. You know, I, I think I did, you know, look, I mean, honestly, I did really good work. I mm -hmm. was pretty smart and it was a really good lawyer. And so I, you know... You were happy yeah. there, obviously. Well, I mean, right? yeah. And again, mm -hmm. when you're doing good work, the senior partners dump the work on you because it makes their lives easier. So right. one of the first things I went, to, you, know, I was a, you know, I was a music fan. I was a student of music. Yeah. And David Geffen was one of the clients of the firm. So I went to Lee Phillips, who was my, again, my boss, and I said, you know, I want to work on this David Geffen record company that you're starting. Hmm. So I started doing that and I, you know, I worked on Geffen stuff and I, and I worked on, you know, some of the clients that I really like, like Jackson Brown and Joni Mitchell. So like Asylum had already happened, right? Asylum had happened and had, you know, he had sold it and gone into retirement and he was coming back and starting a new label, Geffen Records. And this is when he hired like Tom Zutau, Gary Gersh, right? And John Kladner, uh -huh. yeah. Trifecta. <laughs> yeah, so the work I did at the firm, you know, I worked on some of the better clients because I basically did good work. And then I have a really good ear, or I did at the time. I mean, I, I think I, you, know, you, could, you could give yourself credit on that one, Peter. Yeah. I feel like I sent you a lot of music and you, you liked what I sent you, I think, for the most <laughs> part. <laughs> so, you know, I started being able to sort of recognize up and coming artists. And, you know, I started working with Metallica and Guns N' Roses and there was nobody really wanting to sign those bands, to be really honest. Wow. Uh, That's coming up here in the story then. Metallica is like kind of coming yeah. after it. So the David Geffen thing. I worked on Geffen Records. Wrote all the, I wrote all those contracts. 125-page contract, I think you said. Yeah. 
mile and a half long. Yeah, that, and I wrote every word of it. And by oh the end God. of it, nobody was reading it anymore. You got to develop a relationship with Geffen then, obviously, because yeah, you were, yeah. right? That's one of the most legendary people, I think. Super smart, it, right? super talented guy, un unbelievable uh, talent finder, un just incredible. If you had to kind of summarize in a few words, maybe articulate what his genius was, could you do that? I, he just was, I mean, he had incredible taste and he was incredibly smart and, yeah. you know, and charming. You mm, know? Charismatic, very charismatic. Very charismatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. really. He had Lauren Nero, I think. Uh, you've seen the documentary, of course, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. When I got to know him, he was always trying to help her out after, you know, she had left. And um, even down to like, she wanted like the lyrics in the 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 jacket that comes with the music to smell like lilacs or something like that. Yeah, he artists. apparently got that done for her. Yeah, yeah David, David would get stuff done. I mean, he, oh. he, 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 he delivered. He, I mean, people like him and Irving Azoff, they, they really know how to basically uh, control the situation. Well said. Okay, so the Geffen thing goes down, and then you kind of soon after you're meeting Metallica. That yeah, the, the way that sort of happened was... Um, <laughs> I was representing a guy named Lonnie Simmons, who mm -hmm. was uh, had total experience music and total experience was a club. I don't know if you know South Central, and Lonnie was incredibly difficult. And he had the Gap Band and Yarbrough and Peoples, and the Gap Band obviously was very successful. So yeah. Lonnie was always renegotiating his contracts. He was never happy. So there was one. <laughs> there was one. Uh, you know, it was always always urgent how to get it done. So I flew into New York between Christmas and New Year's, where nobody in the record business was working at Holy all. Holy shit. And I was uh, meeting with the business affairs guy trying to get Lonnie's deals done. And there was a guy wandering around the halls, you know, sort of a Jerry, Jerry Garcia-looking guy wandering around the halls with a you know, ter <laughs> Tower Records bag. And the guy that I was meeting with, Ted Green, says, you should meet Cliff Bernstein. He manages Def Leppard. I go, I love Def Leppard. Mm -hmm. Cliff couldn't believe a lawyer liked Def Leppard because, again, that was not what lawyers listened to. They were more into, you know, whatever was new and shiny. Right. All those skinny tie bands out of England. And I was like, I love Def Leppard. So that's mm -hmm. how I got to meet Cliff. And then um, then I met Cliff in L.A. and Irvine He was doing when they were doing a show, and I came and saw him. And then he told me I should check out this band that he was looking at, Metallica. They needed help. They were signed to this kind of onerous record management. Megaforce or something, right? Yeah, or, yeah, right, okay, yeah. yeah. Turns out the guy that ran it at the end of the day was a really decent guy, but mm -hmm. he had him signed to slave contracts. That's So my job, you know, so I met with them and I said, I think I can get you out of these contracts. And that's how I got to know Metallica. There's somewhere in there you saw them perform and you were blown away by them, I yeah, assume, no, right? I, somewhere? I, I think I've told people this story before. I saw them play at the Palladium. And you know, it wasn't what it wasn't what I was listening to. I was listening to Linda Ronstadt, Jackson Brown, the Eagles. Yeah. And I didn't really have a sense of it. And I went and I didn't understand the music, but I just walked out of the place and said, <laughs> I look at James Hetfield as God. He's Jesus. Wow. I mean, he was incredible. And the band was incredible and that's how I got to know them. I thought it was in Brooklyn, no? No, Did they were in it? Brooklyn when I first talked to them. They were in Brooklyn in an apartment with no heat. <laughs> And they were, couldn't get were they all living together in an apartment? No heat. I imagine you have okay, to ask right, them. Right, I was yeah. just talking to them on the phone. They were trying to yeah. get a space heater to work when I was talking to them. Holy shit, Peter! And they had no money, and they had these terrible contracts. And holy shit! And that's how I ended up talking to them because they were just in a bad way. Oh my god! Artists going from like dead broke and just really at the end of their rope. I mean, this is a very common occurrence, isn't it? Where they're yeah. just like, oh and yeah, then something amazing happens, and boom, off to the races. Um, I remember I, I was working with somebody on Skrillex's team, so I know, just as a as an aside, I know like he was in a pretty rough spot. Skrillex was like he was in all this debt, and then, you know. yeah, he was stuck in a contract in a rock band on Capitol. Yes, that I, I had to get him out of. Back to Metallica for a second, though. When that type of success find somebody how do you keep them ground level-headed you know what i'm saying like it's not my job <laughs> <laughs> no i you know i mean I'm, I'm a lawyer i'm not the manager i'm not you that know, would fall on the the manager more so right yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah yeah i mean you know i mean if they want advice i give it to them but i don't really yeah. tell them how to live their lives it's a cool vantage point for you to see that though you know you know, yeah, I mean, you know, look, I've never been reluctant to tell somebody like an artist that they I didn't agree with them and they were, they were maybe wrong. Yeah. But, you know, 
at the end of the day, it's their life, it's their career. It doesn't say my name at the top of the, you know, uh, on the album cover. It says their name, and they should do what they feel is right. And you were in some kind of monster too, right? The Metallica? Yeah. And, and so James was very publicly going through... Was it was it alcohol alcohol yeah. related issues, yeah, yeah. right? And so was that hard to hard to watch? I imagine. Yeah, I mean, James known this a, guy for a while. I've known yeah. him forever. He's mm-hmm. a great. I've known him since he must have been nineteen or something. He's a great guy, and his heart's in the right place, and he wants to do the right thing. And you know, he had a tough upbringing, and he's had to work through all his problems in public. You know, he's still a salt of the earth great guy, and you know, and he's doing good. And I hope he's, he continues to do great because he's a he's incredibly talented person also he was able to bounce back from all that yeah like which is which is great we love a comeback story right peter yeah you know especially with people we like yes especially people we like that's true we don't we don't want an oj comeback story we don't know just for the record (laughs) yeah and then kirk right the amazing guitar player i would imagine he'd be kind of more introverted is he more of an introvert yeah i mean you know they're both pretty introverted i don't know i'd say the extrovert is lars Lars the extrovert. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. It's the drummer. That's not too shocking, I yeah. suppose. So that would that would be a nice segue though into the whole Napster debacle. Obviously, that's like music business history one oh one, right? What happened with Rewritten. that? You like to clear the record on on kind of how that went down. I know can I tell you what my takeaway was, just yeah. as an outsider observing it? Lars was like thrown under the bus. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just because the whole thing was everybody says, you know, they should have worked something out with Napster. There was nothing to work out with Napster. They were giving away music for free. Right. And if they tried to charge for it, there would have been Crapster or some other service that would have been available. Yeah, and there's a famous quote of how can you compete with free? Can't compete with free. Yeah, and yeah, so, so, you know, they were they were just the poster children for this this uh, lawsuit because, you know, I mean, they were doing... They were doing a service to all the musicians. The, the rewritten history is that it was a mistake and it was wrong to sue the fans. They weren't fans. They were th- they, they were thieves. And, yeah. And and you know there was no really good way to monetize it at the time. It, and they, the record companies had tried, but they did this thing called press play or something. They're not technology companies. That was their attempt to duplicate the technology. Well, yeah, it was their right. attempt okay. to you know make would ultimately turn into iTunes, but mm-hmm. they, they couldn't, you know, they're not technology companies. So the mm-hmm. fact of the matter is those lawsuits at least set the ground rules for what you could do and couldn't do. And by the time the technology companies, namely Apple, yeah. came up with a, an effective technology, at least the rules were set. And, you know, Dre was also a plaintiff in that case. And nobody gave Dre any crap about it because basically his fans, like the whiny white kids that, you know, wanted shit for free, Dre's fans respected that he went in the studio and busted his ass and put out great music and they thought he should get paid for what he does. Completely. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. It's like it yeah. The irony is thick because it was like I feel like there's a lot of privileged people upset at that. (laughs) And right? It was like the more privileged people were more upset. Um it was kind of like the first iteration of Karen's. Have you heard the term Karen? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whiny white kids. <laughs> yeah. So there was two plaintiffs, you said, which is kind of uncommon, right? Well, they were the only two people that would step up. Everybody else was like hiding, you know. Were they like deer yeah. in headlights? All the other major artists. Yeah, at they the didn't time? want. To, they didn't want to get involved. They didn't right. look. Look at the crap Metallica took. I mean, you yeah. Know, who, oh. Who that's wants, why. That's why they're like, we're not getting in the firing squad. I yeah, got who, it. Okay. who wants that? And you know, yeah. and it's so much easier to say, yeah, music should be free. The record companies are ripping you yeah. off, and it's easy to say until they go in and try to get their money. Jimmy Ivey went somewhere and had a meeting with somebody. I thought it might have been Steve Jobs, or maybe it was somebody else. But they're like, you know, Jimmy, not every business is meant to last forever. Do you remember that quote? I kind of remember. I know there. Yeah. But then Steve Jobs, it's like. This show is about transition and change and, and making your way to the other side of something difficult, right? And and that's a great example because Steve Jobs was like the white knight in all this, right? Oh, yeah. He, the technology caught up with the, the problem. And, you know, yeah. at some point, free... Look, there's always going to be... Michael Eisner said this. Only 10% of the people are always going to steal it. You know, the idea is to get the other 90% to pay. Yeah. And what happened was they came up with a technology that was easy to use, mm-hmm. was reliable, didn't have a bunch of malware that would, you know, screw up your system, and just became a, a better user experience and not worth the trouble of, you know, the peer-to-peer yeah. sharing, which was kind of a nightmare. 
completely. And yeah. and what do human beings love more than anything? I feel like it's convenience. Convenience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so. You know, they just don't want to pay a whole lot for it, but you know. <laughs> so remind me again. The verdict kind of was against. No, though. You sorry. You won, and then you squashed Napster, and then these these. Well, we other... didn't. We we settled. They took Metallica stuff down and said they wouldn't. Yeah. At some point, there was no reason for us to continue fighting. You know, we. They said they won't put your stuff on the system. We'll block it all. I looked at Lars and said, we got what we came for. And then there was, you know, subsequently the uh, record companies finally woke up yeah. and realized there was a problem. I remember when we started, they, I had record company people telling me, say, we're selling, selling more CDs than ever. What are you talking about? <laughs> they finally woke up and they, you know, they brought their gangs of lawyers and beat these companies into submission mm. and, and basically set the ground rules for what was okay and what wasn't okay. We mentioned Dre, but we didn't, we didn't really get into that. And by the way, Dre raised me. <laughs> the, yeah. the chronic, you know, was like that. It was like the the anthem. Uh, let's see, I was in middle school at the time. So that's kind of that, you know, 13 years old, Peter, is like the age, you know, right. when, when music just kind of captivates you. Um, and I, it was actually Deep Cover. I don't you, you might, you remember Deep Cover? There was, a, there was a movie soundtrack called Deep Cover. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. And so that was like, oh, what is this? It was like sounded so different. So how was, tell us about the first meeting you had with, um, you know, Dr. Dre. I think that'd be phenomenal to just be in the room where you're like, oh, what was that first meeting like? This is kind of funny. Um, I was running Hollywood Records at the time and I thought he was incredibly talented. And I had a group called The Party, which was a bunch of kids from the Mickey Mouse Club. And in fact, for a minute, Britney Spears was in The Party, but mm. she was only nine and the other ones were old at 12. So wow. they didn't... They didn't want, they, they wanted to use a couple more years of the Disney Channel of her career. And at 12 years old, they would maneuver them out. So I said, maybe I can get Dr. Dre to produce a track. That seems like an odd fit, though, I just got to say, right? Well, it was very odd, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but he was so talented. And so I went to um, <laughs> Shug, and uh, I said, can we get Dr. Dre to produce a track? And at the time, Dre was getting sued by Jerry Heller. And couldn't work for anybody. Anytime he would try to do anything, Jerry would sue the record company or oh. the, and stop him. Because he was leaving Ruthless at the time. Yes, and, right, right. Okay, right. So oh. I basically said to Dre, I'll hire you. And so Jerry Heller, who I knew fairly well, actually, mm -hmm. called me up and said, you can't do this. I'm going to sue you. And I go, yeah, see, here's where this goes wrong for you, Jerry. Other people you're dealing with are record executives. I'm a lawyer. I mean, they just have me parading as a record company executive. I don't care. So I he said, well, you're going to ruin my whole thing, you know, and we, you know, I said, look, Jerry, it's really simple. I'll give you 30 grand to, to waive your exclusivity. You tell everybody it was 300,000 and I'll back the story. And then I get to use Dre. And so we ended up using Dre for this project and he produced a track, it took him eight months, but that's Dre. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but at least he got some money. He was getting starved out because he couldn't work and right. he, but he was working on the chronic the whole time and at, at solar studios with dick griffey that's who i called it wasn't sugar it was dick griffey i was on the other side of the dick solar deals with Electra. sound of los angeles recordings yeah, right? yeah yeah and i was the label that you know he was he had a label with Electra records and i was the lawyer for Electra records yeah. okay so it was actually dick that hooked it up that was where you first got acquainted with uh with, with Trey. Trey. Yeah. right 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 and the nwa stuff obviously it already happened and then he was getting starved out and I heard somebody say that the Ruthless Records contracts Trey was under were draconian. They were pretty, you know, they were, were pretty, they pretty bad. Extreme, they were, yeah. You know, I mean, like the Megaforce contracts, you know, yeah. independent labels, you know, not particularly fair. It's interesting because I feel like, you know, there's like what becomes industry standard, Peter. But one of the funny quotes I've heard throughout the years is like, if you show a lawyer that's not a music business lawyer some of the contracts, they're like appalled by some of the shit that's in Right. That's considered standard it, it, in these contracts. If they you know? understand yeah. it, which they generally don't. <laughs> and, you know, he, um, I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest problem was that the label was owned by Eazy -E, who was a member of the group. Yeah. So Eric was making a lot more money than anybody else was. Right. And so there's something that, you know, something to be said for the fact that why should he be profiting at the expense of his bandmates? I, mean, yeah. I think that was really the rub. I think it was less that the contracts were unfair and more that they were very fair to Eric. But, yeah. you know, I mean, you could say to Eric, he put up the money, you know, he, he did the hustle to get the thing started. So, you know. And he worked really hard for that money. It was all dope money. Yeah. <laughs> all dry, you know, yeah. Like, you know. You, got, you got to have a job somewhere. <laughs> what was it? Delivering roses was your thing for a minute? No. Yeah, no, I did that for a while, yeah. <laughs> now, when, when do you officially, what's the 
first album where you're kind of you know Trey's guy and you're you're looking over his deals like it goes <laughs> Dre, to Interscope soon after right? Dre, Dre makes Trey's made three albums, so it's not like there's a lot. <laughs> he did the Chronic when he was uh, getting ready to go to. I mean, when he was being frozen out, and he made the Chronic and took it. I have a funny story about that. And then the first album that I actually was involved in was 2001. What's the funny story, Pete? So, you know, I was working with Dre, and yeah. the record came out, and it blew up. It was number one. And we'd have these music meetings every week with Michael Eisner at Disney. And Michael Eisner came by, and he sees the records at number one. He goes, I thought you had a relationship with this guy. I said, I do. He said, how come we don't have this record? And I go, well, Michael, let me let me just... Let me just read you some of the lyrics. You're a motherfucker, you motherfucker, you know. And let me, you know what this is on the cover? That's a marijuana leaf. And, and, it, and the deal was $4 million. He goes, we can't do that. I go, that's why it's not on the label. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> to be fair, Jimmy probably would have gotten it anyway because he was smarter than I was. But, <laughs> but I didn't even try, I mean, to be really honest. I had enough problems with hip-hop with uh, Disney. Yeah, and that was when I think there was like a fever pitch like dolores tucker and all these oh, yeah. figures were it was ugly they were running on it it was, it was like, a little yeah. later that all that stuff blew up but yeah you were also in the defiant ones right yeah so i'm, I'm typecast I, I play the lawyer <laughs> in all these films <laughs> people don't know you i'm trying to show them diversity in yeah. this interview Peter. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a period where you know dre was languishing which you know you talk about in the defiant ones right aftermath deal happens with interscope for his label yeah. did you oversee that that joint venture deal that's or? where i came in right I, there I came in right my came in they said okay we're separating suge from dre and we're doing a new deal with dre so yeah, i was I in there that. i had no idea what was going on i hadn't read any of the documents and so like the ink was dry on the aftermath deal no no they needed somebody to review it but there was only two days or three days that we had to do it in. it was crazy I mean, wow because Suge and Dre weren't getting along. and They were just like the fallout, right? I think Dre was leaving and Suge was pissed and yeah. that was it. And Jimmy was sort of running a three-ring circus there trying to keep the balls in the air. And, <laughs> and then they brought me in to sort of be the lawyer. So, yeah, it was it was nuts. 